getting started. Hello, everyone. I am Chris Seth Jackson from HowToRunABand.com. This is a the mostly weekly uh, hangout. I'm not always doing this uh, weekly, but hey, you know, I'm doing it. I've been doing it weekly for the last couple weeks, so it's a weekly hangout. I start this off and talk about a do a little bit of a presentation for the first five to ten minutes, and then I open it up to Q and A. So uh, if you got the Google Hangout up and running, then you can just type in your question, and I will answer it to the best of my ability. Unless I have no idea what the answer is. <laughs> so uh, just a legal thing is I am not an entertainment lawyer. So any questions you have about licensing and all that good stuff, I can tell you the stuff I know, but I'm not an entertainment attorney. So always make sure to get your own uh, entertainment attorney before really going through with all this stuff. So that being said, today I'm going to talk about uh, just getting started. That's where I'm at right now with uh, my solo acoustic project that I just started up. Uh, I'm at the very beginning. I'm mainly focusing on writing all the songs before March 7th and getting them ready to perform live more than any social media or tons of booking and stuff. But I'm laying the groundwork in the background to be ready after that show. Because once I've got that show, that means I have a set list down. I can start booking everywhere. So I'm going to show you just the beginnings of what I've been working on, which is WordPress and doing research on venues and festivals. So I'm going to share out my screen here so you can see some of the things I am doing. Maybe. Okay. Hopefully y'all can see that. So this is uh, WordPress. Uh, or This is my website I've done with WordPress. I used a free theme. And just on the front page, I, the only thing I have on it right now is on the front page is just a flyer for the show that uh, one of the other bands made. And uh, there's me, Jackson's Oddities. I'm also be performing in the Them as well. Um, my friend in Sweet Lou Sour Mash set this show up, and he's also a performer in the Them. So it uh, should be a fun show. But as you can see, I just got a simple uh, upcoming gigs over here on the right-hand side. Um, over here, I just got some basic menu items. And hopefully that's not too small for you to see. Maybe I'm going to bump this up in size a little bit. And, uh, yeah, I need to <laughs> change this byline. I didn't realize when I wrote it, I was talking about, like, uh, folk music. So I put dark folk with uh, tall tales and short tunes. I didn't realize dark folk might uh, be misconstrued as being uh, dark-skinned people. So I might need to change that to dark acoustic or something. <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, anyway, got the home page and got a music page. I don't have recorded music yet, but I got the placeholder here. The one thing I did uh, do is create a uh, used a plugin called Ultimate Shortcodes, and I can uh, pop out lyrics right here. So I'm going to start putting all the lyrics on this page, and you can have them kind of accordion is the term they use. So you can see all the lyrics right there, but then pop them down so people can easily look at your lyrics. I'm also I'm going to end up using Bandcamp to embed my music here, and once I get that up and recorded, which will be very soon, and yeah, shows. I use a simple plugin. The plugin uh, is called Gigs Calendar, and it does this upcoming thing. This is called a widget on the sidebar here, and then it does all these. So you can click on this show coming up right here, and you have all your basic information that you can pop into there. Got my blog, which I haven't done anything with yet, and booking, which I haven't done anything yet. I also need to add a bio about me, a media section for photos, and like a press kit section. So that's stuff I'll be working on once I get uh, more stuff. But since I'm starting right from the beginning, you know, I don't have much yet. But let me go here to the dashboard of WordPress for those of you not familiar with WordPress. So WordPress is really easy to maintain your website stuff. It's really easy to install. It's just an awesome way of... Uh, maintaining your website. So uh, posts are for your blog. So when you add a new post, it's just like adding a new blog post that you see on the on a site. Pages are more like the permanent thing that uh, you saw there up there with uh, music and shows and booking. Those are pages. So you can keep adding these and putting them in the up, upper menu or put them as sub-menus or make them private and only share out to people you want to see this stuff. So like if you want to have a page just for your album or a page just for a song or for a store or something like that, you can put those right here. And uh, there's just a ton of options. I love plugins. 
So I have a ton of plugins installed. But uh, the ones I really like for uh, music, it's called Gigs Calendar. And this lets you uh, put all your gigs in and then add like uh, some stuff on the side. On your on for with eh, for widgets. So let me go to that plugin gigs calendar right here to explain how that works real quick. Say so you see all the gigs I have plugged into here. Uh, what you need to do it doesn't have an automatic database of stuff, so you need to keep adding the venues that you want to use. And uh, tours, I really haven't used that feature, but you can group things under a particular tour if you want to. But I haven't used that feature. But you got your venues. And once you entered in the venues, then you can add a new gig. And then you have to select the venue that you've entered. So here's the ones I've already entered. It gives you a lot of other uh, options. You can put tags. You can assign a tour. You can put more information about the event, descriptions, how people can get stuff, uh, tickets, notes, say all ages or 21 plus, you know, all the... 8 p.m. to when the stuff starts. You can also add another performance. So if you have more than one performance in a night, say you're doing multiple sets in a night, you can add that here. And uh, yeah, I've used that. There's a few other uh, gig plugins out there I haven't really used. I saw them, they look nice, but I've gotten used to using this one, so this is the one I use. And uh, yeah, that's Another great one to have, and I'm not going to go too much into plugins because I'll bore the hell out of you. It's just a lot of people ask about how to get their events going for their WordPress site. This is how you do it. So, actually, before I go on to the next one, go here to Appearance and Widgets. And what widgets do, it lets you add things to your sidebar. So, uh, right here you see Upcoming Gigs. Yeah, there's a thing down here you can choose from these guys and you can just drag and drop these things over to your sidebars and a lot of the themes give you multiple sidebars and footers that are at the bottom of your website so it's your choose cho uh, your choice how you use them I just use the primary sidebar on this site right now don't really use anything in the uh, footers or at all but you can do a bunch of stuff like if you have a bunch of categories of blog posts a like box for Facebook so people can start actually I need to put that on there <laughs> uh, images and there's a lot of other plugins out there that add a lot more stuff that you can add to your uh, ooh, Twitter timeline that's good they can add to your stuff so that's just some of the basics of using WordPress WordPress is just how I use uh, websites it's very responsive so uh, by responsive let me go to the website it actually resizes to any screen width so if I pop this to let's see all the way down really small you can see how it resizes and that's awesome if you're on a cell phone or if you're looking at a site from like a tablet or a smaller uh, viewport it just resizes and all those menu items collapse down into this so people can easily go and look at your site from any smartphone or tablet by using a responsive website web theme and Going to themes real quick, because themes are fun. That's what every musician wants is something that looks good. <laughs> you can choose from a shit ton of free themes. Here's some that I already have installed, but you go here to add new. And see, the one I have installed for this site is uh, called Adamos. I think that's how you pronounce it, Adamos or something. But what I did was search for uh, responsive themes. So actually, you can go right down here to layout and look for a responsive layout and do the search again. And you can find all the sites out there. But you can also look at like featured sites that are out there. It's so another one I've used a lot has been uh, I've used responsive. That's been fun. And uh, I also really love customizer right here. But it took me a lot, of bit, a lot of work to make it work exactly the way I want. I just know how this thing works inside and out. But I decided to play with a simpler uh, theme, and that's the Adamos theme. And those are free themes in case you're on a budget. If you want even more awesome themes, you have to start shelling out a little bit. But for really cheap, you can go to websites like uh, themeforest.net. Themeforest has an awesome amount of WordPress themes. So I like going here, go to WordPress, go to popular items. And you see like uh, all these right here are themes that you can preview live. So let me find a fun one. 
most of these are responsive too, so you don't even need to think about most of these. But you want to make sure that they are responsive when you're looking at these. But, uh, all right, I don't know which one. Oh, yeah, X. X is the one I've been looking at lately, which I want to basically buy for all my websites. It looks amazing. So you can go here, you can do a live preview of these sites to see how they look before you buy them. And this one looks beautiful. I love X, the X theme. So I'm going to definitely probably get that for uh, my next site. But it has all these cool things right down here. It even has this parallax type of scroll here where things kind of move slower in the background, giving it kind of a three-dimensional effect, which I love those as well. But you can uh, install this thing called Sh Ultimate Short Codes and upgrade the plugin for $25, and you can add your own parallax effects. That's a little bit advanced, but whatever. So the good thing about this X theme that I liked, <laughs> and this is just one of the tons of themes, is that it's basically like 10 themes in one, or 30 themes in one. You can make this thing look any way you want. That's just one example. There's also WooThemes.com, and there's also ElegantThemes.com. And so those are just different places you can go to find really awesome themes that you can use for WordPress. And once you've found a theme, you can uh, just upload it and to install it. So there's like an upload right here to install a theme. And just browse the zip file that they give you, and boom, there you go. You have a, a theme. And once you have a theme installed, you can customize it any way you want. So you can go here and start mucking with things like the site title and play with the logo. You can upload something. Right now I just have some font, but you can actually upload your logo there. You can play with the colors, add a background image. And for some reason I added a background image here just to see what was going to happen, and this particular theme is not letting it show, so I think that's a bug with this theme. Yeah, but you can play with a whole bunch of little features here when you start customizing your theme, and each theme has a different way of customizing it. So it's very flexible. I love WordPress for band stuff just because the amount of things you can do with it. There's thousands of free plugins to use. So just the amount of stuff just available for free is amazing. And yeah, I got a ton of plugins here that I use and I'm always finding more. Short Codes Ultimate, I always recommend getting this one. It's fun as well. So moving on, because I'm going to start getting geeky and bore the hell out of you. <laughs> The second half of this is about uh, organizing with, uh, I, I like organizing with spreadsheets on Google uh, Drive. Yeah, Google Drive. It used to be called Google Docs, so I keep wanting to say Google Docs, but it's Google Drive now. <laughs> so uh, I like to research all my venues, and I'm starting from scratch, and I'm doing acoustic music, where before I was doing metal and punk and really loud stuff. So I don't have that to fall back on, so I'm having to research from scratch all these different venues that I can use for uh, acoustic music. So let me open up that set list, or this list right here. All right, uh, I need to update these to be in Seattle. But the basics, uh, let me bump up this so you can see a little bit better. There we go. So here's the things just in Seattle. I didn't put Seattle here because I just look and look at them and know they're in Seattle. But I'm also trying to add, I guess I'll do it right now, like capacity of venues. That's good to know because if a place has 350 people and you're just starting out, it's probably not a good club to book. So I'm probably going to remove this. I was just like at writing down a bunch of clubs off the top of my head. But yeah, know the capacity. I think this is about like 150 people here. And that's a little bit more closer to the places I want to play but I have 150 people. So I like writing down the capacity, city, you know, name of the venue. Right here, I like to put like the drive amount. Like how long does is, is it take to get from my home to the venue? So I'm trying to keep things within two hours of where I live for right now. So I put right here, and this, this helps when I plan how I'm going to do my driving. So I don't want to book something that's like, <laughs> you know, an hour and a half north, and then the next night book something that's an hour and a half south. So I want to be careful about how I'm arranging these, south-southwest. And that's why I'm putting the south-southwest stuff. I like to book things in uh, loops. So I like going, hey, I'm going to book northerly 
for this week or the first two weeks of May. Then the second two weeks, I'm going to book south, southwest. So I got all these places here, so I can just easily look at these coordinates, east and west, and know how I can start booking, if that makes sense. So here's just the beginnings of what I do. I try to keep track of all this stuff. Eventually, I'm also going to add uh, a column here for uh, last contacted. So when I start contacting these venues, I want to put in the date last contacted. So when it comes time for me to do another round of booking, I can see when the last time I contacted them was and if it's time to contact them again. I usually like waiting two weeks between contacts. And uh, right here, I like putting last booked. Because if I book something, then I don't want to keep contacting them if I already had a show there. So I want to at least give it a month, a month or two, before contacting or before uh, trying to book a show for a particular date. So it's not that I won't start contacting them again. I just want to know, like, hey, if I booked April, I probably don't want to shoot until the end of May or in June, if that makes any sense. And uh, I got little tabs right down here. So these are, like, the venues in Washington State. And now I'm starting to compile a list of uh, festivals that I'd like to be playing. And what I'm getting into right here is, first, I like just getting to the site really quick and knowing when the dates of these festivals occur. And then right here, I'm going to start putting in uh, deadlines. Some of these places, like the Olympic Olympia Acoustic Festival, doesn't have any clear deadlines I saw on their site. So, but I assume since it's happening in March, it's probably too late. <laughs> and uh, Northwest, Northwest Folklife Festival, I think they start booking, uh, I think they said spring, or actually, yeah, winter. So I probably needed to start like uh, in October, December, November that time. So I start trying to get something booked here. Good thing about the Northwest Folklife is that I can busk. So I saw that. I can busk around this festival. And uh, I looked at Bumper Shoot, and you can't, busk around bumper shoots. I didn't add that as a viable uh, festival to book on. But hey, maybe I should anyway. Hmm. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry, I'm thinking this stuff out. I'm start I'm already I'm just actually I put these two in there last night. So I'm still thinking about festivals and how to contact them. But going to their website, seeing here when to start contacting them, put that stuff in there or any deadlines. And that way I know just keep in uh, just keep it organized how I'm going to start contacting all these festivals and organizing my time around it. And if you go back to my site, I saw that these, uh, since Northwest Punk or Folklife has a bunch of, uh, lets you uh, do any busking that you want, and there's going to be a ton of people at these Folklife festivals, I booked myself for each day to be there every day, TBD. So that's a, it's busking, but whatever, you know, some people made fun of me for busking and suggesting that as a, an avenue for musicians, but you know what, screw them. <laughs> you can make money, and you can make friends, So, uh, and you're playing stuff when otherwise you can't get booked. And that's the end of my presentation. I'm now going to open this up for questions, so feel free to type in the Q&A box. I'm going to switch back here and stop sharing the screen. Yeah, so uh, anyone who would like to ask a question... Type into the questions here, and I will definitely answer it. <laughs> Bueller. Bueller. All right. Yeah, I actually realized that it, there's a one-minute wait from the time I ask something here, and then you it actually shows up in the Q&A box. So i got to remember to keep talking. So anytime now, make sure you pop open a question in there. Um, yeah, I'll definitely answer it. I think I'm repeating myself now. Well, that's okay. That's what I do. I'm going to drink a cup of coffee. Yeah, I've been mainly focusing on writing music. I've had only one month to write a full set list. So I've written about eight songs. And now I'm trying to memorize all the lyrics of the songs I've written. Plus, I've been a bass guitarist, so... I'm doing this acoustic guitar, so it's a little bit of an, uh, a learning curve for me to get my hands used to playing really small versus the big bass. So that's why I haven't done a lot with this website and I haven't done a lot with booking. I don't have any photographs in yet. So at this venue, I'm going to record myself playing live, 
the, at my first show, record myself playing live, put that stuff up on YouTube, get that on the site. Then uh, my girlfriend's going to be nice enough to take, she has a really nice camera, so she's going to take photographs of me, so I can put that up there as well for any type of um, uh, press kit stuff. Do that at first until I get enough money to hire a professional photo shoot. Um, then I'm going to start, since I'm just... My just my voice and acoustic guitar. I'm going to start recording stuff and getting things up onto uh, CD Baby and Spotify to get the music out there. I'm also going to remove the vocals, just have the acoustic ground tracks, just to uh, start uploading as uh, possible things for people to use in TV shows or film or anything like that. And we got a question from Sterling Silver. Hey, Sterling. Let's see. Does busking really bring in any money? And do farmers markets typically pay, or are you basically busking there? Let's see. Does busking really bring in any money? Depends on how you do it, and depends on where you're at. A lot of professional buskers know where to go. They know where the crowds are, and so it takes them a while to figure out where the good spots throughout the city are. Uh, I know there's a girl who uh, works here in the Pike Place Public Market, that's a, also a farmer's market. Uh, she makes a full-time living busking. It's a lot of people going through there, a lot of foot track, a lot of tourists, a lot of people wanting to be entertained. And she plays violin, and boom, that's how she does it. With uh, busking, you have to... I think you need to have other things for donation or for sale. So it's not just your music. You also have your CDs in there. And uh, I saw a news report on a guy that... You know, he had a little portable organ, that, and he always had his CDs out there, and he'd play on the docks where all the tourists were coming in back and forth, and also would be getting on ferries to, for their commutes, and they, he'd sell out his CDs every day, and that's how he made his living. So um, for farmer's markets, so it, it really depends. It depends on the music you're playing. depends on where you're at, you know, if you can actually get enough, you know, if there's enough foot traffic for you. I mean, sometimes you're only busking just to uh, get people let people know that you're having a show that night somewhere. <laughs> or are you doing it because you have no other gig to play, you know? And I've made money doing it. Uh, not a lot, but enough to, you know, put some money in the gas tank, get get a meal. And when I was smoking, enough for a pack of cigarettes, you know? So, uh, yeah, there's a little bit of money there. For farmer's markets, uh, it depends on the farmer's market. Um, so uh, in the Pike Place Public Market here in Seattle, which is one place I've busked, you have to pay there them for a permit, and, and then there's a whole bunch of designated spots that you go and play. So you play there, and then like you usually give the spot up after a half an hour, just being courteous to other musicians that want to take those spots. So you don't take the prime spot and only stand and then hog it. You don't do that. That's an asshole move. So it depends on the farmers market. Uh, how I don't think any of them actually pay you for busking. Um, I saw some stuff with a Bumbershoot Festival that they had actually pay the street performers. I don't know how that works. So uh, it depends on the place. Hopefully that answers your question, Sterling. And this one's from Eric Fog T Man. I don't know how to, if I'm pronouncing that right. So I'll just say Eric. <laughs> Hi, Chris. I'm Eric from Argentina. I just want to know how you manage the pay to play kind of gigs. And do I ever pay to play, or do you charge a fixed amount of money? I never pay to play. Never pay to play. I do not do it. It's bullshit. It's destructive to the music community. It's all these venues whining, well, we need to make sure we get enough people in in order to... And bullshit. They're selling alcohol for a ton of money. And those pay to play gigs usually are making you charge a shit ton of money for the ticket while you only get a small percentage of the damn ticket price. So you're selling like an 8 to $10 ticket and you're only getting $2 while you're doing all the freaking work and they don't do shit. So fuck pay to play. There's a website if you want to read into it a lot more and they're a lot more eloquent, <laughs> eloquent than I am. It's called neverpaytoplay.com. Neverpaytoplay.com. I avoid those gigs like a fucking plague and they're not they always say they're like they're also disguise themselves as battle the bands. They also say, "Oh wow, this is a great way of getting into this big venue and playing these giant stages." It's just a crock of shit. They're trying to take your money, 
you usually don't build a good fan base there. You're playing with other shitty musicians, musicians so none of the musicians are there to like support a scene. They're like there to work against you. They're jockeying for ticket sales, and a lot of times you rip yourself off. Like if, for instance, it's that scenario where it's like two dollars, you only get two dollars per ticket. You usually end up eating that cost. So if it's an eight dollar ticket, you will sell it for six dollars and not get your own two dollars. One and another thing, if people actually come in through the door of these places, these pay-to-play things, you don't get any money from the door. They're assholes that way. So fuck pay-to-play. You're the entertainment for the night. You should get paid or pay. Fuck, just pay for free. You know, just play for free. Anyway, so your second question. Do you ever pay to play or do you charge a fixed amount of money? So I already answered the never pay to play. <laughs> I'd rather play a street corner. I'd rather play a house show. I'd rather get a friend's basement, do a backyard gig, or rent my own venue. That's the only time I would pay to play is if I'm renting the venue. Then I'll put together the acts, do the promotion, and do it right, and have a lot of fun with it. That's how the old school punk rock way, when uh you know like Black Flag and Dead Kennedys and all those guys they uh. You know, they got a VFW halls. They got a whole bunch of you know places that they could rent for the day, for the night, and do shows. And they just that's how they did it. So uh, as far as charging a fixed amount of money, no. Uh, at this point in my career, I don't charge money because I don't have enough leverage to charge money. I do expect to get paid from venues that have people paying in the door. So when I contact a venue, I ask them what the pay is. I make sure I understand how the bands get paid. And I try to get that in an email. So that way when I show up at the show, I can pretty much count the heads. And I know what I'm getting. So like I know if the bar gets like ten, or the sound guy gets 10% payout, then I know from the money I get at the end of the night, I can count the number of people there. And if I look around and see that the numbers aren't adding up right, then I get to talk to the people and say, hey, this doesn't look right. Um, so if there's an arrangement for money, I like those. I put those, any venue that actually does give me money, I love. I put those on the places to always play. Um, as far as uh, charging an amount, it depends on your leverage. It also depends on what you can negotiate and your negotiating skills. If you're on tour or if you need to travel really far to play a gig, if you can, work out some type of arrangement to pay for your gas money or to pay for your expenses. That's the only time I would ask for a payment, but it's not guaranteed you'll get that payment. So um, it's really, it really boils down to leverage. If you can sell out a club, then you can negotiate whatever you want. <laughs> if you can sell out a club, you can negotiate a bigger price. But the thing is, sometimes that price might be lowballing yourself, so you might rather take a percentage of the door instead of a guarantee. So um, really, when you're first starting out and you're trying to build an audience, uh, asking for a guarantee, not that great. If you're trying to make a living off this stuff, um, try to get some type of dollar amount. Try to say, hey, we need to at least, you know, we're spending $20 on flyers and we're spending $30 on gas to get here. We need to get that much at least to cover our costs. You know, you can usually talk to a venue when, especially when you're traveling far away, to get that type of agreement. But make sure ahead of time how you're getting paid, and make sure you're going to get paid at all. Because I've had surprises where I've traveled 10 hours just to find out the place I'm playing is a benefit. The best thing to do is always have merch, always have merchandise to sell, and always have a tip jar. <laughs> so if you get there, you always have something to sell. So if you get screwed over by the bar itself. You have merchandise to sell that you just hustle to sell throughout the venue. And you also have a tip jar. So people say, hey, you know, we're on the road. We're a traveling band. We need uh, money to get to the next gig. Any, if you all can throw in a dollar if you like the music, that would really help out. So that's another way to uh, get some extra cash. So hopefully that answers your question. I'm not quite sure how things work in Argentina. So I don't know if most of my experience is from the U.S. and doing a lot of West Coast tours. So, great question. Yeah, anybody else have any questions? Here until uh, for another half hour. So feel free to ask some more questions. I would love to answer them. <laughs> it says four viewers. I wish I could 
click on this and see who's actually viewing. That would be so much more fun. But I can't. I'd like to say hi to you guys. <laughs> Come on, Google, we'll put in that feature. <laughs> Yeah, I hate pay-to-play stuff. So ugh, You can get me going on that all night. There was a pay-to-play organization that sued one of my friends, and she won the lawsuit because she proved that they actually are shitty shows and none of the stuff she's saying is any slander whatsoever. She was actually able to take photographic evidence of how horrible their shows are. <laughs> so uh, she was able to win the lawsuit and made them pay for all the legal fees. Just to just to let you know what type of people you're dealing with pay to play stuff, man. They're just slimy individuals, and most of the time they're not even in the same area that you are booking the show, and they're not going to promote the show at all. So you're lucky to even be listed on the venue's calendar. All right, Eric, got another question for you. Thanks for the amazing answers. Oh, you're welcome. What are the first items of merch you should have when you're starting out? CDs, T-shirts. CDs, T-shirts, buttons, stickers. Those are the first few things you need. Uh, CDs, uh, a cheap way to do it without a... I was just talking to someone else about this. It's going to be in a podcast I'm releasing tomorrow. But I was talking to Billy Gryzak of musicmarketingmind.com, and he uses a service called Kunaki. Kunaki.com. K-U-N-A-K-I.com. And what they are, they are a fulfillment company for CDs. They'll, you upload all your stuff for a CD, and they, um, they'll just ship it to you. So you can only order, you can just order one CD, or you can order a thousand CDs. They'll ship it to you for a really low cost. So for like a first few CDs, it's like one dollar per CD. It's really affordable, plus shipping. Or if you want to buy a hundred or a thousand, you know, it's like a dollar to a dollar seventy-five per CD, plus shipping handling. So it's on demand. So if, instead of buying like 100 CDs or 1,000 CDs and all of a sudden you just have a lot of stuff sitting around and you're not making a profit on it yet until you sell like 20 to 30, you can just buy five CDs because you don't know if you're going to sell them out the show or not from Kanaki.com. They ship them. Then you sell out the five. It's like, cool, now order the next five. And that way you're not overstocking all your stuff. And then you can keep your stuff, your sales down, or not your sales, uh, your, your stock down while you're maximizing your profit. So you sell them for $10 each, and boom, there you go. And nowadays with uh, digital downloads, I don't know, if people from a show, they don't want digital downloads. They'd like it in addition to whatever they're buying, but they're there to take a physical memory from the show. So usually it's something physical. CDs are still something physical. Uh, see a lot of bands there, not a lot, but quite a few bands are selling vinyls, like uh, split 7-inch vinyls. You know, good artwork, something they can do, like a collector's piece from the show, some type of memory, something to keep a memory from. Uh, for T-shirts, make sure that you have both male and female shirts. So uh, the male shirts don't fit women that well. So anytime you can do T-shirts that also fit a woman's body, you'll sell a lot more of those because a lot of bands don't do that for the girls, for the ladies, for the women. Not girls, women. Girls is demeaning. Uh, a lot of the women out there, just the guy bands, just don't think of catering to them. And you shouldn't be that person. So try to split your, when you order a, a slew of t-shirts, make sure you split between male and female. And make sure the audience knows when you're on stage that that's what you got. And there's a ton of places to order stickers and buttons from for really cheap. Uh, I think there's stickerguy.com, 123stickers, uh, custombuttons.com, uh, a ton of stuff. So, yeah, it's a. Those are the basics, and then you want to expand out from there. Just be creative, and then it's up to you and your personality of your band. The things you can sell, you can sell anything and everything. Be creative. Have things that are at like hundred dollar price points because you never know if someone's going to buy it or not. Uh, I have a friend that she says she will sell the shirt off her back in order to make it to the next gig. Hopefully, that answers your question. Thanks for asking, Eric. Then Sterling Silver. Let's see. Ah, what's happening here? Select. Just a thought for other people to check to see if they have that in their area. Oh, let me get this other one. There we go. All right. I'm learning that city gigs pay much more than bars, restaurants. 
Here in SoCal, we have something called Concert Share, where all the cities in the area show up and bands can have a booth to showcase what they offer. What's a city gig? Don't know what you're talking about. A city gig? What is that? I'm going to look that up. A city gig. I'm not sure what that is. It's the first time hearing of a city gig. That's different than playing a venue. And concert share. What is concert share? You stumped me, Sterling, so <laughs> maybe I have to come back to that. So I'm looking at this stuff. I like this because I get up the stuff out there and people uh, teach me new things I never heard of before. So concert share. Is that a service? I'm not even seeing something for that service. So yeah, um, Sterling, uh, if you could follow up on that, it's basically concerts in the park, festivals, etc. Okay. Um, if you can get those gigs, yeah. Uh, sometimes those gigs are hard to get. So uh, yeah, like the festivals, as I was talking about before at the beginning, they can pay really well if you can get them. And that's up there with a uh, concert or college gigs. They can pay really well as they can play really well too. I usually don't talk about those things because they're they can be harder to get. You need to have your shit in order. You need to have your press and your video of you playing live, and you need to have your ducks in a row before you contact them. So usually a lot of bands I've been talking to don't have their ducks in a row, and they're just doing the regular like touring. But yeah, I'm, plus I don't have a ton of experience with booking festivals, but yeah, lucrative if you can get them. But I've even, I'm seeing even some of the festivals, you don't get reimbursed. They're just saying, hey, you can play. So I'm seeing that from a few of the festivals. If you're getting on the smaller stages, you're just getting the chance of getting your music out there, which I think is great. Because there's a ton of people that go out to these festivals, concerts in the park, etc. And yeah, they that's a great way to do it. Yeah, Sterling, if you want to send me an email, it's seth at howtorunaband.com and tell me how you do that stuff. I'd Love to hear more about that. Educate me. <laughs> yeah, now that I'm doing this acoustic stuff, I actually fit in with a lot more festivals, which uh, my punk metal bands, they didn't always fit in with most of the festivals. And then the bigger festivals were like the Mayhem Festival and Warped Tour, things like that, were a little bit too big for my band to get on. So now that I'm doing the acoustic thing, there's a lot more acoustic, solo musician-friendly things I can do. So... I really don't know what the payout is on those, or, but I do know they're sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to get. But from what you're saying, you get paid more. So, yeah, getting paid gigs is always better than getting no gigs. <laughs> so, uh, actually, I want to talk about that really quick. And, yeah, thanks for letting me know about that, Sterling. Um, it's a mistake I made with my old band, a uh, band called The Them. And uh, as you see, we're doing an acoustic uh, brief reunion, but it's just for fun. Um, but there were places that actually offered us money, like $100 to play. You know, not a ton. But, you know, $100 or $75, and it's just guaranteed money. doesn't matter how many people show up or not. And, like, boom, there's your money. And we decided we didn't want to play some of those gigs because we weren't building new fans. It wasn't, they weren't really cool places to play. And we thought... We need to be building fans first, and now I'm kicking myself in the ass for doing that, because um, you know, you need to get money. <laughs> you know, paying playing like a few of those gigs a month would pay for recording a single, or pay for like stocking up all our merch. So, I guess the, the thing is just learning from my mistakes is don't. If you get a paying gig, do it. If you get guaranteed pay, do it. Unless it's something shitty like. One girl wanted us to travel to uh, like three hours, three to four hours to travel to play her birthday party, where she said we're not, we're gonna get like twenty bucks. And I was like, girl, no, <laughs> not playing your birthday party for twenty bucks when it's a four-hour drive. That's like eighty dollars in gas, and you know we're gonna be stopping and getting stuff to eat along the way, and plus it's like 
eight hours round trip driving just for one show where it's only getting paid twenty bucks after you know ugh, no forget that got another question from Eric uh oh it just messed up all right why is it messed up hey Eric can you resubmit your question for some reason this is not let me hang on a sec questions answered questions go down here okay do you think doing a podcast for my own band would be interesting for fans uh, there's talk uh, about quite uh, quite a few uh, Online gurus are talking about this. I know the Music uh, Biz Weekly guys suggest it for bands to start their own podcast. I do my own podcast for uh, How to Run a Band. Honestly, is it worth it? It depends. <laughs> so it's a bit of work. So you're going to be recording, you know, about an hour's worth of audio. You know, depending how long you want your podcast to be, it could only be 20 minutes. Then you got to set up everything with iTunes. You got to get your stuff uploaded. You got to have a Libsyn account. You got to have the right things to make your stuff sound good. And uh, so there's a little bit of work there. And when you do record a podcast, you got to edit the podcast, upload it. So there's work there. So you have to be aware of the work. So when you're doing the stuff, you need to be consistent with it. So you need, if you have a weekly podcast, and it needs to be coming out weekly at the same time. So uh, the more consistent you are with it the better you are with the podcast, and it depends on how entertaining you are. If you are entertaining, and you get good interviews on there, and you make things sound good, then, yeah, it's worth it if you can get an audience that way. I say it's definitely worth it, but you need to take your band out of the picture, because sometimes you need to think more about the fans that are listening. It's not about you, the people that are going to be tuning in. They're going to be tuning in to be entertained, so you need to be entertaining. So it's not simply you just playing newer music all the time. That might be boring. I don't know. You might be able to get away with it. I don't know. But um, podcasting for a musician, I think it's one of those... Uh, it could be. depends on you and your level of entertainment and how you're entertaining people. So I listen to things like, you know, if I want to know how people are being entertained, I listen to shows like Adam Carolla Show or WTF by Mark Marin. And I listen to how they do things, or the Howard Stern Show. They really entertain people with their content, and they can do that stuff for hours and keep people listening the whole time. So you have to ask yourself, you know, you have to look at things like that and say, can I do content like that? So it depends on what format you want, how you're going to present it, and how you're going to entertain people. The bottom line is entertaining. So if you're not entertaining people, it's not worth doing the podcast. If you are entertaining people, like doing interviews with other bands in your genre, you know, keeping it really entertaining and funny and keeping it fresh material, then go for it. Then it'll be worth it. So I don't know how entertaining you are, so I can't answer that. <laughs> so if you're willing to do the work and keep on it on a consistent basis and willing to experiment and fail with it a little bit first because you're going to fail with your first few podcasts, you're not going to sound that great, uh, and you're willing to keep improving quality, it's one of those uphill things, and it's going to take a bit of experimenting with you. But I think in the end it could be extremely valuable for you just for the skill set of podcasting alone. And another question from Eric here. Oh, okay. Same thing again. Okay. My idea is the band members talking about what we're doing, things that are happening around at the end of the review, and play some other band's music in the local scene. Um, it depends if your band is boring or not. It really does depend. I mean, it's like if what you're doing is, uh, yeah, I work my day job. Yeah. That was a good rehearsal. I didn't really write anything this week. Yeah, I'm going to go smoke some weed. It depends on the rapport between your band. Can you get on there and start being really hilarious with each other? That might be too new. People might want to listen to that. You know, it's... The local scene stuff, I think, is a great idea. Getting Not only playing other bands' music, but getting some other musicians in. I think it's a great way to network. So you have a podcast that promotes other local music and bands that you want to be with, get them on there. That's a great way of building a network of people. So if you can do it entertaining, you know, keep it fresh, keep the music in there, and if your band members actually are talking in a way that is entertaining and clear, 
Because I've heard podcasts where people are just like cracking up and giggling and you don't even know what they're laughing about. That's not entertaining. That's just confusing and annoying. So, yeah, play with it. See if it's something your band members want to do. That's I wanted to do a podcast with uh, my last band and couldn't really get it started because our schedules were so far off and I couldn't get everyone in the same room at the same time. So it would have probably just ended up being me doing it by myself, which I didn't feel would have been good for the band. So it depends on the commitment level of your band to be there every week. And uh, also keep in mind that you need to have... You might need to use your mixing board and get everyone microphones so everyone's uh, stuff sounds clear in, in the recording. So the more people you have in there, the more difficult it is to make it uh, everyone make it so everyone can hear what everyone's saying. So make sure you have good miking solution. So uh, honestly, keep it simple for your first thing. Uh, maybe even mic the room, see how that sounds. Just a... Uh, it could be good for a networking thing. It's going to take practice to get a, a get a flow going. Um, but yeah, you can do it. Podcast, it's it's worth experimenting with. But I can't guarantee you to do anything for your band or you'll get any listenership. Because then you got to promote the podcast. So after you get that going, you got to get up on iTunes. you got to get up on uh, all these different sharing sites. And you got to get people sharing the podcast. So it depends. Experiment with it. See if you're comfortable with that level of work. See if your band's committed to it. And, you know, make sure getting other bands on the line is workable in your area. And, uh, yeah, see if you can actually get them physically in the studio or you might have to do things where you conference and conference them in on Skype. I use Skype a lot for my recording interviews. So uh, hopefully that helps. I know I'm being vague, but honestly I don't know what the results are. I've seen a few podcasts out there that, uh, you know, there's musicians that can just get a great weekly conversation going with a whole bunch of other musicians, and it really reveals a lot about the bands and the music, and there's others out there that just suck, so <laughs> I don't know if it's going to do anything positive for your music or not, but it's a good skill set to have podcasting, So, but it is a skill you need to develop. Does that help, Eric? I know I'm being vague, but there's no clear answer on things like that. Because, I don't know, I've also found that if you uh, overload yourself too much with shit that is not your core, which is writing music, you can really end up burning yourself out and not focusing on the important things. So if you overload yourself with social media, it's like, oh, I'm doing a webcast, I'm doing a podcast, oh, I'm doing this vlog and my blog and I'm doing all this other... You know, it's if you overwhelm yourself, then sometimes you can distract you from doing the most important things with your music. So make sure you have your timetable out for important things like writing new music, recording schedules, and gigging, and make sure that something like doing a podcast fits into your schedule and allows you... You know, it actually allows you to do that because I don't know if you're only sleeping like two hours a day in order to get all this stuff done, you're going to burn out quick. You know, you can burn the midnight oil for a few days at a time, but then it's going to come back and bite you in the ass. And that burning out is a something that can happen with a lot of bands. So it does happen. It's happened with me even. So be careful where you really put your energies. But yeah, and even if you do a podcast once a month, it might be worth it. I'd say try it out, have fun with it. Make sure you're having fun with it, and if it turns into work, bleh, don't do it. <laughs> All right, we're getting near the end here. Yeah, there's David. Okay, i got to put this up there. Fuck pay to play, DIY all the way. Hey, David. <laughs> yeah, fuck DIY. Oh, fuck DIY. Ha! <laughs> no, fuck pay to play. Um... But just an important point on DIY. Do it yourself at first, but then build out a team. So once you get to a certain point where you're uh, capable of doing a lot on your own, you're actually booking the gigs, you're getting people out to the gigs, you're starting to bring in money, you're starting to be profitable as a band, then get in other people to do things that are that can help you out to accentuate what you're already doing. Don't 
So, uh, you know, like actually, that's probably a lot more than a 10-minute topic, but, you know, there's there's a point of DIY where it becomes uh, self-defeating to try to do everything yourself when you could pay someone else to do it and help you out and br- take off some of the burden from you. Like I was talking about before with Eric, is that, you know, you're doing a podcast, an example of paying somebody else, you're doing a podcast, you know, you're recording it for an hour, and then you're spending like two to three hours editing it together and putting it on the site. Well, how about just hiring somebody else to do that for you? You know, like maybe there's a friend that wouldn't mind sitting down and doing that for like 25 or $50 a month. Or maybe there's someone you can hire outsource on, like outsource to the Philippines. That's stuff I study as a trying to be an entrepreneur is how to outsource things. So there's ways of doing that stuff. If you have enough money coming in and those, uh, you know, and you have a means of paying for things, it's it's good to take that, not put all that money and reinvest, put it into your own pockets, but actually to reinvest into the systems of your band. You know, so hiring out someone else to take off the burden for you, like make your pod, make your podcast sound good, to make your blog post look good, maybe to do some of your social media planning for you. Like if you have an album coming out, someone to might be worth paying, you know, five hundred to a thousand dollars to someone to, you know, really plan how to sell that CD because it or promote that album because if you can get your album out there and start making it, making big hits with it, then that one thousand dollars can turn turn into ten thousand dollars worth of profit. So it's something to keep in mind. Yeah, do DIY it for yourself at first, but keep in mind that. As you grow, you need to be able to scale, and there's only so much of your own time that you have. So you, there's only 24 hours in a day. <laughs> so if you once you start getting income in, start l- looking at how you can take that income to free up your time, and you can get more done. So uh, yeah, hey David, <laughs> good question. It's a there's a someone uh, called Sarah Saturday, and she started something called Earn It Yourself EIY, and because she was a DIY artist and doing things herself. She was solo doing stuff with like a laptop and an acoustic guitar. And uh, what happened is she started getting successful. As soon as she started getting successful and building out a team, all these people that were like, oh, you're DIY, fuck you. They started like really ragging on her that, you know, she's not a DIY artist. She's a sellout, all this other shit. So she started the EIY, earn it yourself, to kind of combat that, DIY mentality once you get past the point of being 100% DIY. So sometimes that happens with like, you know, David, we're in a lot of the punk and metal scene here. You get a lot of that mentality here that likes to, when someone starts succeeding, they like to tear them down. So she kind of did that site to fight against that. And, ah, got Eric again. I'm a musician, but I'm also a web developer. For a band or musician, how much should I charge to make them a basic blog or WordPress site? If it's not appropriate to respond here, where should I email you? Yeah, well, I'm trying to figure that out myself. <laughs> I charge $499 to put together a WordPress website. And that's actually at the low end of doing a WordPress website. Uh, for bands, they always shirk at that number, but actually that's an extremely fair number, $499. I know you're from Argentina, so I don't know how $499 converts to uh, Argentinian currency, but that's the basic here. I mean, you shouldn't be charging below $399 to put together a website for a musician or for anyone. If you look out there, I've looked at quite a few different services offering to WordPress, uh, building a WordPress website for someone, and the prices, a lot of them start at $1,000 because it takes a few days of work. And you can put together a great website for someone. It's a great benefit for them. A great website is going to bring in a lot more money than the five hundred dollars that they <laughs> that you charged. So my uh, the, I think the bottom low end of that is four hundred ninety nine dollars. I think uh, you can really charge a few thousand dollars for a really well done customized website. So if you really want to throw in a lot of effort and they're asking for a lot of uh, detailed work beyond a basic. WordPress theme that you provide them, then then you should be charging more or like a, a different package for them. So the basic package, something basic, you know, out of the box that you already know how to put together, like five hundred dollars uh, to be charging more than that. Uh, if they want more customized stuff. Put together your own packages, something at a thousand dollars, something at two thousand dollars, something at three thousand dollars, 
and then the musicians can choose what they would like. So hopefully that helps. Uh, I'm starting to learn that selling to musicians is kind of difficult. So <laughs> good luck with that. Um, yeah, otherwise, I'm still trying to figure it out myself, so I'm not going to give away too many of uh, the secrets I've been learning trying to figure it out. <laughs> so hopefully that helps, Eric. And it's getting uh, 6.55 in five minutes. I'm going to be getting off here to start doing my own. Uh, I have to memorize lyrics for eight songs for my next gig. So uh, <laughs> I'm only three songs in for memorization, and I'm not that great at memorizing them yet. So anyway, thanks for joining. Go to howtorunaband.com and sign up for my email list, and you get a free ebook. Uh, get more fans to your shows. And also you get a lot of emails like with extra training, some I think some more videos in there to help you out with booking. So uh, yeah, okay, I'm going to be here for another four minutes. So if anyone else has a question, I'll be here for four more minutes before signing out. And I'm going to drink a little bit more coffee. I need a little bit more caffeine. I'm not, the world isn't vibrating enough around me. I need to get caffeine. That's really it probably sounds disgusting me like drinking directly into the microphone here. <laughs> David, happy, 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 joy, joy, happy, happy, joy, joy. All right, go back to all right, David again. Running the Joe, the Josephine, for two years, which I believe to be the most prolific and one of the longest standing DIY places in Seattle. I got a grasp of the ideas of EIY, and once that was understood, we were able to have a reliable stage at all times and make everyone happy. Hell yeah, David. Right on. Yeah, I haven't played the... Actually, I haven't been to the Josephine yet. I really want to go. I love underground venues. Actually, I had someone on Indie on the Move asking me a whole bunch of details about uh, the Josephine, but I was just like, yeah, it's a venue. I won't say any more. You need to contact them to get how many details they want to share out to the public. So, <laughs> but yeah, so that's awesome. Grasping the ideas of EIY and reliable stage at all times make everyone. I, I, we need to have a beer and chat about that someday. I'd love to hear about it. And I need a gig at the Josephine. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> Take care, David. And then Eric. Stay fresh, boy. Or, all right, so Eric. <laughs> Had a blast of this hangout. I learned a lot and laughed a lot too. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, got me thinking. Like, a, I don't like say. There's another like the podcast stuff. I didn't like being like so wishy-washy about it. But yeah, it's just when you jump into some of the social media stuff, it could be overwhelming and it can be a lot of work. I, I hear other people saying musicians should be doing podcasts. Yeah, unless you suck at podcasts. <laughs> If you suck at podcasts, don't do them, because that turns people off, and it's like, so, I, I found the best way of podcasts is getting other people to talk, because if it's just you talking or just your bandmates, it gets boring, so if you can bring in new blood into that podcast, it keeps things a lot more fresh, better perspectives, get some musicians in there with some funny road stories, and you got a winning thing, so find some traveling musicians that are can tell some really hilarious road stories. And then, you know, throughout your podcast, just pitch, like, your stuff. You know, it's like something at the beginning, pitch your stuff. Maybe something in the middle, pitch your stuff. And then at the end, try to get people to sign up to your list. So just like, just like I did here at the end of this, I said, hey, sign, go to howtorunaband.com and sign up for my email list, and you get a free ebook. Get people onto your email list. So that's a big thing with uh, the podcast is not only it, – it's a big lead generation is how we call it in the marketing world – Get people from the podcast onto your email list. That's how Facebook, Twitter, everything else should be getting people from those things onto your email list. And usually it goes from like the, from Twitter, Facebook, podcast, all that stuff goes to their website. From the website, then people sign up for your email list. And then from your email list, you start selling them shit and keeping them informed of shows and start building that 1,000 true fans. So hopefully that helps. That's kind of the sales funnel type thing. And, uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, for showing up. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, David. Thank you, Sterling. And, uh, yeah, hopefully I get to see you again uh, next week. I try to do this every Wednesday at 6 p.m. unless I have a show or I need to uh, memorize a whole bunch of lyrics. <laughs> All right, take care, everyone. Goodbye.